This is wrestling's greatest moments. Hey now, wrestling fans. Wrestling fans have many fond memories of the lovable losers who've counted the lights for their opponents weekly in the WWF. However, the WWF wasn't the only promotion to feature lovable losers. Sit back as Wrestling's Greatest Moments looks at legendary choppers from the NWA and beyond. Before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell so you don't miss a single video. Whether you call them jobbers, preliminary wrestlers, or enhancement talent, these wrestlers weren't in it to win it, but to make their opponents look like a million bucks and give wrestling fans an idea of what an opponent could do in the ring. As discussed last time, jobbers came from various backgrounds. Some were former greats who lost a step with age. Others were up-and-coming performers looking to make a name for themselves. Others were capable wrestlers who lacked the look, opportunity, or X-factor that made their colleagues into stars. Whatever the case, these wrestlers served a vital role in wrestling, and their contributions should never be ignored or understated. This time, we'll be looking at jobbers better known for their careers outside the WWF. Although, like many wrestlers, they may have worked in the Federation occasionally. And remember, don't worry if your favorite enhancement talent isn't on the list, because we've got more videos on the way, including ones focusing on specific stars and teams. We've already produced several videos on wrestling's hapless competitors, so be sure to check them out. Tommy Angel, aka Tommy Barrett, had a fascinating career as an enhancement talent. He broke into wrestling in 1985 after serving four years in the 82nd Airborne Division as a paratrooper. Tommy trained with veteran wrestlers Nelson Royal and Gene Anderson, learning the fundamentals and an essential skill wanted enhancement talent to master, how not to injure the top stars. Angel recalls, We would spend a lot of time going through, doing the moves on each other. We'd have matches with Nelson. Gene couldn't work anymore, but just understanding how to give an arm drag, take an arm drag, body slams, all the different moves so you know how to protect the person so he wouldn't get hurt. Because Nelson said, if you hurt the top guy, they're gonna fire you and you'll never work again. Tommy began wrestling in 1986, taking his kayfabe surname from the tattoo he'd gotten during his military service. The tattoo read, Angels of Death, and featured a skull wearing a beret and holding a knife in its mouth. Angel would hone his skills in Jim Crockett promotions, proving his talent at making opponents look good and protecting them. Work followed elsewhere, including time in the WWF, where Vince McMahon was willing to pay a premium for talented enhancement talent. Tommy Angel also toured New Japan Pro Wrestling. The talented Tumblr enjoyed a modest push when he worked in Nelson Royal's Atlantic Coast Wrestling, where he held the promotion's TV and Tag Team Championship. By 1994, Angel decided to hang up his boots and never looked back. Like many of wrestling's best enhancement talents, Angel earned the respect of some of the sport's top stars. During an episode of his podcast, Arn Anderson praised Angel. Tommy was a hell of a hand and one of the carpenters that helped build our industry. Wrestling was more than a job to George South. It likely saved his life. George's parents died when he was young. And as noted in the article, a visit with number one Paul Jones and George South. Largely unsupervised, every opportunity presented itself for George to find himself in a lot of trouble. But what kept him on course was his love of wrestling. If he got in trouble, he wouldn't be allowed to watch Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling that Saturday on TV on Channel 3. And he wouldn't be allowed to go to the Park Center on Monday night. Worst yet, he wouldn't be allowed to follow the exploits of his childhood hero, number one Paul Jones. Thankfully, South's passion for wrestling kept him out of trouble, and like many wrestlers, he made the jump from being a fan to an in-ring competitor. South debuted around 1984, competing in championship wrestling from Florida before a lengthy run in Jim Crockett promotions, where he largely put opponents over, but earned their respect for his work ethic, talent, and ability to safeguard opponents. Given his skills, it was inevitable that promoters would tap him for double, or in this case, triple duty. South donned a mask, teaming with fellow jobber Gary Royal to work as the Gladiators. More about this team later. The debilitated duo also competed as the Cruel Connection in hideous costumes that Blade Braxton described as the most hideous outfit that is not poultry-related in the history of professional wrestling. South became a go-to jobber for Crockett Promotions, earning the admiration of many wrestlers around him, not the least of whom was NWA World Heavyweight Champion Nature Boy Ric Flair. As George South recalls it, 
when I worked for Jim Crockett Promotions, I checked the booking sheets. If I was working on a TV taping with Ric Flair in the main event, I knew I was making a house payment that week. Rick always treated me right. Once, he paid me to drive his robes to Atlanta for an appearance he was doing on Good Morning America. I was going down the highway in my $1,000 Nissan, saying to myself, I've got close to $100,000 worth of robes in my trunk. Something ain't right about this. His skills put him in demand, and George competed in the WWF, WCW, Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and other promotions. George South still wrestles and also trains aspiring wrestlers. His son, George South Jr., now wrestles. In 2012, George Sr. published his memoir, Dad, You Don't Work, You Wrestle. Rocket King went from being homeless to a fixture on national television when he became a professional wrestler for Jim Crockett Promotions. King tried to break into the industry at a time when outsiders were still frequently rejected. However, his perseverance paid off, and he used this opportunity to become one of the 80s and early 90s best-known enhancement talents. He was involved in high-profile programs with the Four Horsemen during their feud against Sting and Sting's Dude with Attitudes. King also became Michael Hayes and Jimmy Garvin's manager and valet, Little Richard Marley, for a short program before the Freebirds kicked him to the curb. Later, Rocky served as an advocate for the homeless, recalling a promise he made when he was homeless. I promised God if I made it, I'd feed the homeless. King kept his promise, founding a wrestling school and promotion that used its profits for charity. He also organized other charitable events, including golf tournaments with comedian Jeff Foxworthy. Fellow enhancement talent George South had this to say about King. He was just a fun-loving, happy guy with an infectious personality. All the boys loved him and also had great respect for his work. He was a jobber that earned his way up the ranks. So much so, the office was putting him over in some house shows and I worked him several times putting him over. He was a fan favorite amongst our talent level. One of the good guys, he'll be missed. While Canadian native George Scrapiron Kadaski was often used to put over opponents, the burly wrestler was as tough as his nickname. George built up his strength and toughness by playing hockey and working in lumber camps in Canada. This, combined with his time weightlifting, transformed him into the perfect candidate for professional wrestling. After training with Stu Hart, he traveled through the territories in the United States before settling in the American Wrestling Association. Scrap Iron proved a reliable hand who could help break in new stars. One such wrestler was Ric Flair, who wrestled Gadaski early in his career. While reports differ, Flair believed Scrap Iron was his first opponent. Gadaski also enjoyed his moment in the sun when he worked a program alongside AWA legend The Crusher. According to the article, The Interesting Road of George Scrap Iron Gadaski, in the late 70s, George was allied with The Crusher in a memorable main event run against Super Destroyer and Lord Alfred Hayes. The angle was initiated on TV when Crusher threw down a challenge to the headline tag team with a partner of his choice. Destroyer and Hayes accepted, and Crusher proceeded to pull George from under the ring, where he was posing as a utility slash sewer worker. The feud drew sellouts in cities throughout the AWA territory. George Gadaski died in 1982 after a bout with cancer. Another name near and dear to AWA fans is Jake the Milkman Milliman. Milliman counted the lights regularly in the promotion, but also found time to job in the WWF. According to the article, the Milkman delivers, sort of, the legend of Jake Milliman. His biggest claim to fame before his sudden rise in popularity, if you can even call it that, happened in 1988. He was the jobber who lost to ravishing Rick Rude. That night, Rude would flirt with Jake the Snake Roberts' wife, Cheryl, starting a hot feud between the two superstars. Milliman had a brief flash of glory during his AWA dying days. While some fans would argue AWA went on life support as soon as Hulk Hogan and a small army of talent left Vern Gagne's promotion for the WWF, we're talking 1990. This was during the legendarily bad Team Challenge series, when three teams of wrestlers competed in various events in an empty warehouse for a kayfabe $1 million prize. The Team Challenge isn't important, although we'll cover it in a future video. What is important is that Jake was a member of Larry Zabisco's Larry's Legends team, and he battled Colonel De Beers in a turkey on a pole match. Milliman scored the upset of his career when he defeated De Beers, one of AWA's top stars, by securing the turkey. Jobbing is more than an art, it's an attitude. Just ask enhancement talent Mike Jackson, who began wrestling in the 1970s and became a fixture on wrestling programs throughout the South and later in the WWF. 
Jackson broke into wrestling thanks to his friendship with the referee's son. The two attended many shows together, and over time, Jackson's friend worked the local wrestling shows in support roles such as ringing the bell and parking cars. The man who would later be named Action Jackson took over his friend's role when his friend left for college. One thing led to another, and he began refereeing. While Mike wanted to become a wrestler, the local promoter discouraged him because of his size. Jackson went to work for a local outlaw promotion, but was eventually asked to join a sanctioned group, working his way through various territories, including Continental Wrestling Association and Championship Wrestling from Florida. Jackson also competed in the WWF for several years as enhancement talent, and he's a familiar face for fans of many different promotions. In 2020, Mike Jackson showed that septuagenarians can still job. Jackson stunned the wrestling world when he appeared on an episode of Impact Wrestling, putting on a virtuoso performance against Johnny Swinger that included a spot where Jackson went old school, walking on the top rope as he kept Swinger in a wrist lock. Despite his nickname as the Continental Nobleman, there was little noble about Turco's in-ring persona as he played a sore loser. Perhaps it was his tendency to lose his matches that made him so sore. Regardless, Turco did get around the wrestling world, competing in wrestling's many territories, great and small, throughout his career. Whether he competed as the Matador or Baron Joe, Turco entertained fans with his performances as he arrogantly paraded around the ring before his matches like he was the second coming of Luthez, only to inevitably lose. Mulkey Mania is running wild. Such was the case for real-life brothers Bill and Randy in 1987, when the previously winless duo, at least that's how Jim Crockett Promotions built them, did the unthinkable. At the time, Jim Crockett Promotions was holding qualifiers for its second annual Jim Crockett Senior Memorial Tag Team Tournament. The Mulkies battled the Gladiators, George South and Gary Royal, and somehow pulled off the upset of the century by defeating them and advancing to the Crockett Cup. Soon, Mulkey Mania electrified fans in JCP as the team became unlikely heroes. Everyone likes a good underdog story, and the Mulkies fit the bill. However, their luck didn't last long as they lost their first round match against Denny Brown and Chris Champion. Nevertheless, the Mulkies' win made fans believe that anything was possible with a band of brothers, and lightning might strike twice. The Thunderfoots are another interesting example of how a wrestler's career can take many twists and turns. Joel Jones, better known as the wrestler Joel Deaton, began competing in the territories. In 1984, Deaton donned a mask and worked in Jim Crockett Promotions as Thunderfoot. Managed by James J. Dillon, Thunderfoot used a loaded boot to get the advantage over opponents, teaming with Dillon's client, Black Bart. Things changed when Dillon began serving as the Four Horsemen's executive director, and Deaton was joined by a second Thunderfoot. Unfortunately, the team was used to put other teams over. Deaton left Jim Crockett Promotions, but the Thunderfoot team continued there, routinely counting the lights. Do you remember these wrestlers who weren't short on talent, but inevitably came up short in the ring? Should promoters bring back jobbers and jobbers to the stars? Who are your favorites, and what other stars would you like to see profiled? Share your thoughts in the comments section, and let us know if there are any videos you'd like wrestling's greatest moments to cover. In the meantime, subscribe to our channel, follow us on X and Instagram, and spread the good news about wrestling's greatest moments, the channel that celebrates the squared circle.